Rudy, welcome to the show. Wow, this is weird. <laughs> oh, how the tables have turned. It's like I'm sleeping on the wrong side of the bed or or something like that. <laughs> how did you get here? Uh, well, I figured it's time for me to be interviewed because during Father David Michael's Concert for Life, while we were preparing for it, I was talking with uh, Keenan mm-hmm. Anikiarico, a mm-hmm. uh, former guest, and I'd mentioned something about my personal life, and he said, oh, really? And I realized that he didn't know anything really about me. And then I started thinking about that. Uh, you know, I have all these guests coming in, telling me their life story, opening up their hearts, just pouring it out on the table for everyone to see. And I realized that they don't know anything about me. I mean, the least I could do is tell my story too, even if it's going to be hard, even if I'm very uncomfortable being on the other side of the screen with the cameras on this side instead of that side. Yeah, yeah. we really did flip the tables on you. Yeah. See, I'm not even the one wearing the In the Pew shirt. You are. I know. What can I say? <laughs> it's great. <laughs> what do you like to be called, Rudy? Do you go by Rudy or Rodolfo? Rodolfo. My dad used to call me that. Rodolfo. When I heard Rodolfo, I was in trouble. Oh, that's when you knew? <laughs> that's- Rudy's fine. Rudy. Even though I'm not... I, until now, I'm still not completely used to being called Rudy. Oh, really? Yeah, because my dad was Rudy. Okay. My dad was Rudy. So at school, they always called me Rodolfo. It was only when we moved to the Philippines that people start, start calling me Rudy because Rodolfo seemed too formal. But growing up, it was Rodolfo. See, I met you as Rudy, so I assumed it was always. Yeah, I, I've got this weird personality thing where I've got different names. <laughs> People who worked with me when I was in radio, mm-hmm. they call me by my radio on air name, uh-huh. which is Rick. Yeah. Okay. So like, third name. <laughs> Rick. There's a whole story behind that. Oh, we'll get there. Yeah. Don't you worry. And then my family, they call me a different name too. Huh. Yeah. They call me Toy, which is short for Totoy, which means little kid. Because because when we were growing up in Hawaii, I was like a, a scrawny skinny tiny little kid so they called me that because herm who works on the podcast we grew up together in hawaii Mm -hmm. he was jun which is short for junior okay which is very common for a junior but since he already had it i couldn't take it you couldn't be another yeah i couldn't be a jun with two juns running around at at parties in hawaii so i became totoi which eventually became toy and then at school i was rodolfo and then at work i became Rick. rick And then when I became a teacher, it was Mr. G. So I've got multiple personality I see that. disorder. Yes. <laughs> nice. So but Rudy's fine. Rudy's fine. Okay, we'll go with Rudy. And if another <laughs> name comes out, I'm sure you'll be used to it. But it, but but if I get out of line as a guest, you can come say Rodolfo. I, I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> You're the host. I'll, I'll let your dad stick to that okay. one. I'll, I'll just call you Rudy. Okay. Okay, so Rudy, tell me, were you born here? You've talked about Hawaii, I, Philippines. I was born in Delaware. Oh, wow. My dad was in the Navy and mm-hmm. my mom was the nurse. Very typical for Filipinos, especially during the, the 60s. So my dad was in the Navy. He was in that area, you know, in, Phila- in that Philadelphia area. And my mom was a nurse. And it's funny because they met in Philadelphia, but growing up, at one point, they were one bus ride away from each other in the Philippines, but they ended up meeting in Philadelphia. Oh, wow. Yeah. Shortly after, shortly after I was born, though, like I was two months old, we moved to Hawaii, okay. where I really say I'm from. When people say, where are you from? I say I'm from Hawaii, because that's, that's all I remembered growing up. How long were you there for? Oh, I was there until my teens. Okay. Yeah. Growing up in Hawaii um, was... Uh, it was different because my dad was in the Navy, so he was he was out for months at a time because it was the Cold War, mm-hmm. so his ship was out a lot, so he'd be out for eight to ten months at a time. So my mom was, uh, she was the one that really held the family together, yeah. And were you Catholic at the time? Yes. You were Catholic? Born and raised Catholic, but we were Sunday Catholics because uh-huh. my mom was, you know, she was holding the family together because my dad was out a lot. So she was the one who was, you know, take us to church on Sunday, bring us to, a, you know, faith formation classes, which is funny because the faith formation classes that we had were on base, you oh, know? Wow. Yeah, it was um, on base. So there, were, there was a year that we had 
our faith formation classes in the side of a volcano because the the housing the uh, the military housing that we were on was inside the crater of a small volcano that you, you couldn't tell it was a volcano did the volcano because ever explode it's a no it's a dead volcano it's <laughs> okay. been dead for millions of years <laughs> okay. but it looked like it looked like you were surrounded by mountains oh, but cool. in actuality it was you were inside a volcano and and on the side of the volcano they had created like bunkers you mm-hmm. know they dug tunnels and it, they became bunkers and we used some of those bunkers for faith formation oh, at times fine. yeah it was it was pretty weird like you're in you're in like a little cave but there are tables and everything and we had for, faith formation there but it was very it was tough because we moved around a lot mm-hmm. so i couldn't really develop in terms of my knowledge of the faith and mm-hmm. you know um because we it was like we were always starting over again yeah. whenever we moved because i mean we moved back and forth from hawaii seattle um we were in California for a very short period of time. We, yeah, but we moved around a lot. So I can say that my my faith was just in its infancy up until my teens. And you say we. Do you have any siblings? It was just you and your parents? I'm the oldest son, the only son. And then I have two younger sisters, Christine and Cindy. Christine, she's uh, she goes here to St. Faustina also. She has uh, five kids. Um, Cindy, she she also goes to Faust- here at St. Faustina. She just moved here. Um, just a few months ago, she has, a uh, she has one kid and a stepson. Yeah. So the whole family's back together. We're all back together. Yeah. There were times when we were, we, we, we had some of them, you know, move around, but we're all back here at St. Faustina. We keep coming back here to St. Faustina. Nice. Okay. So childhood in Hawaii. And then you talked about like early teens. Is that when you moved to the Philippines or are you still there? My dad, when he retired, after he retired, he wanted to move the family to the Philippines. Um, for a few reasons. Uh, one reason was, you know, economically, a mm-hmm. dollar goes a long way in the Philippines. They could send us to a Catholic school in the Philippines. They could afford to do that. Oh, nice. um, and other things, you know, we got to learn the culture, the language as well. But it was an adjustment. It was a real adjustment, culture shock. I can only imagine. To, you know, growing up in Hawaii. And the next thing you know, I'm in an all boys school, an all boys Catholic school. Oh, boy. That was different. <laughs> How was that? Well, you know, uh, I hardly know anything about my faith at the time. Yeah. So my classmates, they'd grown up in it. Mm-hmm. They had taken religion classes all their lives. Uh, you know, they'd, so I, the, w- when I was in Hawaii, the only thing I knew about the rosary was when my grandma would visit. I, st- I can still see it. If I close my eyes, I can still see her sitting at the end of the hall, holding her rosary, praying at night. And that's all I knew about the rosary. Um, but you know, in the Philippines, you know, you've got um, things like the the Santo Nino traveling from house to house and, you know, people praying novenas and all of that. And I I was like one of those wide-eyed guys. I'm like, I have no idea what's going on here. What is this sorcery? I know, what is this? This is a, this is a lot of prayers, you know? I'm like, and everybody had everything memorized. This is Sunday Mass enough. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so in, in Hawaii, uh, in, excuse me, in the Philippines, when I moved to Manila, I went to an all boys Catholic school. So it was a real education in the faith. I was like from ground zero. I almost failed out of high school because of my religion grade. No way. I had a 62 <laughs> in religion. So what my uncle did was he told me, okay, I'm going to let you watch these cartoons about faith. They're called Flying House and Superbook. Like Veggie Tales? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like Veggie Tales, but a lot more Catholic. Okay. So yeah, it was like Bible stories, and it, I, I, I was like really a baby when it came to my faith. I think knew I nothing that. whatsoever. But I feel like that was so many of us, right? Yeah. Growing up. But you know, everyone around you knows so much more. It's, oh yeah. But I, eventually, I did. I got my study habits in check, and then okay. you know, I started to do better in. In religion class, I wasn't, I was fantastic, but it was pretty good. Yeah. When would you say like your first encounter? Cause, okay. So you're starting to learn. Mm-hmm. Did you like right away know like, oh, this is something that's important for me. This is real. Or was at this point just like trying to get a good grade and get that 60. Just up? trying to get a good grade. My first, I want to say my first real experience was it was a retreat in high school called days with the Lord. Mm-hmm. It's somewhat okay. similar to the acts retreat. Mm-hmm. Not really, but it's similar in the way that it was geared towards high school boys. Yeah. And that was so powerful for me 
that the acts, uh, the, excuse me, the um, days with the Lord retreat. That was my first real experience. But of course, you know, I was a teenager, so I started to fall away again. Of course. Thinking about other things like girls. And then my next big experience was, um, so after high school, I went to UST in the Philippines. Yeah. Right. University of Santo Tomas in the Philippines. It was, um, so going from Jesuit to Dominican okay. was very different. The teaching styles, very different from Jesuit to to Dominican. So in USD was Dominican. Mm-hmm. And that was, you know, it's, what do they call it? The Royal Pontifical University. Yes. Wow. So yeah. official. <laughs> yeah. So I, if I'm not mistaken, 1611, it was founded. So it's wow. the oldest university in Asia. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest Catholic universities. So my first real experience there was I was, so I fell away okay. from the the faith and everything in college, especially. And I was, there was one time that it got really bad for me. Mm-hmm. I, I was breaking up with my high school girlfriend. We were in college. We kind of drifted apart and I was in a bad place and I'm going to date myself here, but, um, Pope John Paul II was in the Philippines for World Youth Day that year. Oh, wow. It was, and World Youth Day in the Philippines is a huge thing. Millions of people come out, literally millions come out to the street to see him and the parade yeah. and everything or the mass at the grandstand. Anyway, I was not in a good place mm. at the time. And I remember there was a terrorist group that was threatening to kill him and I had, uh, it was big news too that the terrorist group was threatening to kill him. They didn't want anything to happen because it would have been embarrassment for the yeah. the Philippines. And my family was watching the parade on television. It was a huge event. So everyone was gathered around the television except for me, you know, and I come up to the television and, I'm, and they're all watching it. And me being a, like trying to be edgy, I guess, or smart <laughs> aleck, I come up and I say, and I'm so embarrassed that I said this, but I said, did they get him yet? Oh. And I cannot forget the look on my dad's face. Wow. It was like, I can't, I can't, I can't even describe the look on his face. Yeah. And yeah. And th- that's how far I had fallen. Yeah. But then a couple years later, after I was in a bit of a better place, mm-hmm. um, I had emceed, it was one of my first emceeing gigs. I'd emceed like a contest. Um, in UST, and one of the priests, he uh, he seen me MC, and I guess he was impressed. And when I passed by, because it was Ash Wednesday, what they did at the the campus ministry was they had the priest just standing out there giving people ashes. Can we can we have your tag? Just give me a Catholic tag. Yeah. So so I, they, I I saw one of my classmates. I said, "Where'd you get that? Did you have to go to mass?" And he goes, "No, you just pass by the campus ministry. There's a there's a priest standing right out there. He'll give you your ashes." So I go over there and I I get my ashes, and he said, "You were the one that emceed the thing the other night." I was like, "Yeah." He goes, "I need you to do something for me." Oh, wow. I was like, "What's that?" He's like, "I need you to do a voiceover for me," which is so. This was for like sort of a mini retreat that they had Mm -hmm. like a praise and worship type thing that they had for freshmen Mm -hmm. now when i was a freshman going through it i was like i don't want to be here you know of course i hated it (laughs) i even at one point i even made an excuse to leave early i said i gotta go to work yeah that's how bad it was but then you know fast forward a few years the priest is asking me can you do the voiceover for jesus we're gonna put jesus's face up on the screen and we want you to speak for him, say his words. Wow. And at this point, had you wanted to go into voiceover? Is no, this something this was, you had thought about? This was the first experience I ever had. Oh, wow. And I remember I went with my girlfriend at the time mm-hmm. and I, it, I did it several times. But one time I went with my girlfriend at the time and I did the voiceover. I thought nothing of it. I looked at her and she was crying. Wow. She said that was really powerful. And I didn't even realize at the time, you know, how important a gig that was. Yeah. I thought it was just, okay, I get to read, you know, kind of a little self-centered too, mm-hmm. you know. I'm your, the main character. Your ego, you know, <laughs> I didn't realize there were a couple of times I didn't show up to do it because, you know, I was busy, wow. you know, even though I didn't have class. 
but yeah. And was she Catholic? Yes. Okay. Yeah, she also helped me, you know, with my faith. Um, yeah, just just having friends who are really faithful, it really helps. And Community. Yeah, so exactly. Crucial. Exactly. So you're in the Philippines, going to university at this yes. point, start emceeing. Yeah, and I had a huge MC gig also. One of the probably one of the biggest MC gigs that I ever did was the baccalaureate mass for when I was a junior. Oh wow. What they did was they decided we'll do one instead of separate baccalaureate masses for the different colleges of the mm-hmm. university. They said we're going to get the entire university, the entire graduating batch of the university to come for one huge baccalaureate mass. Mm-hmm. So it looked like the mass when the pope was there. Because oh it was the grandstand and then the whole soccer field filled with, you know, filled with all the students, all their parents mm-hmm. and all of the professors. Yeah. All, and it was the biggest gig that I'd ever, I think I'd ever done. Wow. Just, yeah. And of course, I didn't really understand how important it was. <laughs> it's funny how like all these things, you're doing all these gigs, all these voiceovers, all surrounded by Catholic things. Yeah. I, one thing I remember about that was the priest, the one who who gave me the ashes and got uh-huh. me for that gig. He was making fun of me after the mass because I had two major goof ups during that mass. The oh. first one was um, right before the priest says, "I confess to Almighty God." I was so nervous. I said it before he did. <laughs> he was still doing that thing, and he goes, "Just just on the microphone." Yeah, starting it for like, everyone. Yeah, he's supposed to start it, right? I'm supposed to wait for the priest to say it. Correct. But I. I also never saw that. I confessed to Almighty God and to you, my brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Something to that. So <laughs> nice. And then the second thing that uh, the second major goof up, and you know, when, when you're an MC or voice telling, you always remember the bad things. Of course. And the um, the other and and of course that priest, he 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 never let, let me live it down. Was oh, I wouldn't have let you live it down either. During the consecration, I was standing there, I'm like. Do I kneel? Do I not kneel? I'm up on stage because everyone else is priest. I'm the only one who's not a priest on the stage. <laughs> so wait, why were you on stage at a mass? Because I was the lector or something. I don't know. <laughs> I, I was behind the lectern and okay. I was supposed, they wanted me to, to read all of everything that the. Like the responses yeah. for the faithful. Yeah. So okay. I was there and I, so I was up on stage and it's consecration and I'm like, do I kneel? Do I not kneel? And he said, and I came down from the stage after the whole thing. He was like, you were so unsure whether or not you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> he he never let me live that one down. I remember that. That and oh, the and the the rector of the university looking at me like, who is this guy? <laughs> that's my part. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's my line. You know, <laughs> just steal a priest line. Yeah, stealing a priest line. Did you ever think about the priesthood? Oh no, no! I was so far from the priesthood. I mean, the only time that I ever thought of, oh, maybe I should have considered priesthood, was like later, later on when I was already, you know, married, and you know, yeah, a little late for that one. Yeah, just a little too late <laughs> for the bus for that. on that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you're married. Yes, I am, but I, but that was years later. That's years later. Yeah. Okay. So college, it's college girlfriend. That's what your wife? No, okay. No, uh, yeah, that's a story. So after college, I got into advertising. Okay, I was an nice. advertising executive, and that was a, still in the Philippines. That was in the Philippines. Okay. It was a it was a large multinational um, corporation, and I was working in advertising. And that was a rat race. Okay. I was uh, yeah. I, I decided mm, this life is not for me. Yeah, I, I had no time for anything. Yeah, like I, I always missed all family parties. Like you can't miss the party. Where is he? Rudy. It's like he's working. Where is he? He's working. I remember the centennial celebration for Philippine independence. Mm-hmm. Okay, it was a huge holiday. I was at work and I saw the parade go by the building. And I- <laughs> was that? Oh, I guess because it was a multinational form, y'all weren't closed. No, I, we were closed, but I was still working. That's how busy I was. I was, it was just, it was a huge load of work. Wow. Yeah. It was a real rat race. I figured that wasn't for me. So yeah, no. um, one of my classmates who, uh, who sat beside me, she was also an international student. She said hey, she was working for a radio station. She said, Hey, you know, I think you'd be good on radio. You know, could you, could you come in and try it out? So I did try it out. Wow. Yeah. So at that time that you were on in that firm working advertisement, mm-hmm. 
had you kind of stopped emceeing and doing voiceovers that you were doing in college? Oh, I never really, yeah. That, that was just something I did in college, kind of. Did in college, yeah. I never really thought of it. Thought that was the end of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I tried to do a like a professional voice. I remember auditioning for a professional voiceover gig when I was in college. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> it was so embarrassing. I remember looking at my girlfriend like, this is going really bad. <laughs> okay. And so from there... So you're you're at this firm, yeah. and now you start working in radio. I I start working in radio, mm-hmm. and that's when my life got worse, when then it ever was. Because you know I'm living in radio, and you're sort of a pseudo celebrity. You kind of mm-hmm. get full of yourself. Mm. You know, you think you, you you get really conceited. Yeah. And um, I met a girl, mm-hmm. And I got into a relationship, which is not a an ideal relationship. Mm-hmm. She was married. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, she was married, not in a happy marriage. And I was, you know, Superman complex. I can save this girl from yeah. this, you know, unhappy marriage. And also I, I was, it was really dumb. In my, they weren't married in the church. Mm-hmm. So I had this really twisted way of thinking, well, they're not really married. Mm-hmm. You know, I, they're, 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 they're not married in the church. So they're not really married. So uh, I started that relationship and it was not an ideal relationship. I remember, uh, this is a story that I've never really told, but we were going out on a date. And since I had that twisted way of thinking, we went to church, we went to mass together. Wow. And one of the readings, I can't remember what exactly, I should have looked it up before this interview, but one of the readings was something to the effect of the way it is on earth, so it is in heaven. Mm, What you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And so God was speaking to me right there. You should not be doing this, what you're doing right now. And I didn't listen. I was so full of myself. I thought I knew better. A lot of people were telling me, you got to get out of this relationship. Get out of there. This is not right. And I just didn't listen to them. And, you know, sure enough, several months later, we find out she's pregnant and and I'm pretty much shunned from the family. Wow. And, uh, you know, of course we had some relatives who were reaching out to me, trying to help me out and everything, but it was, it was a bad relationship. It was, I don't want to say anything bad about the mother yeah. of my daughter, but let's just say that it was toxic yeah it wasn't healthy for you not healthy for us because we were kind of on an island we didn't have any support it was just it was just us and when and also when you when you build a relationship on a bad foundation Mm. no matter what you build on it it will keep crumbling down yeah because it was a bad foundation so it was it was a toxic environment it was bad for both of us we would both said and done things Mm -hmm. that were uh, were not good yeah. And we both carry scars and we both have regrets. Um, so after that, I was in a really bad place. After yeah. after we split up, I was in such a bad place that I I really fallen. I, you know, I had flings. Mm. I, you know, I I did lots of things that I don't even want to speak of, that mm. I'm not proud of. I was just not in a good place. Let's yeah. just say I was not in a good place. And I remember um, my friends who worked with me at the radio station I was working at at the time, I'd moved radio stations because mm-hmm. um, I was fired or let go from the previous radio station because of um, things related to my uh, relationship. Wow. Because the my one of my, my first gigs at a radio station my girlfriend at the time was helped me get the job. Okay. But then I had left her for that married woman. Wow. And her workmates were not happy about that. Yeah. And they kind of pressured the radio station to fire me and I deserved to be fired to, to let me go. And yeah, so they let me go. And it was like my dreams were crushed because I, I thought, you know, oh, I'm going to be a famous DJ on the radio, mm-hmm. you know, all of that. And then, and anyway, these um, these friends, they were, you know, what's happening to this guy? He's regressing. He's, you know, I, I fell into video game addiction, fell into other things. 
and until I finally started. And my, I was the prodigal son. I moved back in with my parents and I still remember the conversation asking my dad, can you take me back? Wow. I need your help. And I can imagine that being hard. It was hard because I was so proud when I'm, you know, when the family wouldn't, you know, wouldn't uh, recognize our relationship. I was like, I don't need them. Yeah. You know, it's, I it's us it. against the world, you know, that kind of, uh, that kind of really dumb thing. But then I had to come back to my parents because I needed their help. Yeah. You know, things weren't going well for me um, personally, spiritually, financially. Things were just not going well. I was, uh, I was not getting voiceover gigs. I was not getting MC gigs, you know, and I was, you know, down in the dumps career wise, uh, emotionally and all that. And they took me in. Wow. I mean, yeah, the love of, uh, of a family. My mom really, I, I gotta say, there's nothing like the love of a mother. Yeah. What a gift. Nothing like the love of a mother. She never stopped. Even if she kind of had to reach out to me through other relatives. <laughs> Just so my dad wouldn't know. Because my dad was, I hurt my dad yeah. deeply. I heard, I heard him. He he was like, no, this is wrong. This is, you know. But yeah, I moved in with my parents. They helped me get back on my feet. Next thing you know, when I turned my life around, things just started to click. Mm. You know, I'm not one to talk about prosperity gospel. But, you know, once I started turning my life around, I got hired by another radio station. Wow. And things started getting better. I started getting more voiceover gigs, started getting MC gigs. At one point, I was the official voice of Listerine in the Philippines. <laughs> yeah. I was like, nice. Cool, mid Listerine. You know, it was like, yeah, that was the. And then, um, and then I started dating a workmate of mine mm -hmm. who was one of the friends that I told you that was shaking their head saying, you know, what's happening? This is Rudy? not it. This yeah, isn't it. This is, yeah. And I, you know, we, we started dating. She, she had just broken up with her boyfriend and I was, um, you know, I was single and we, we just started hanging out. And next thing you know, you know, we're dating and she's my wife now. Yeah. we the, Providence. <laughs> we love it. Yeah. So we, we got married and, you know, we, uh, and my daughter, mm -hmm. ever since the split up with, uh, with me and her mom, my daughter stayed with me. Okay. So she moved in with me and my, my parents. So when we got married, a lot of our, uh, some of our relatives said, oh, we thought your daughter was going to live with your parents. I said, no, no, she's going to live with us. Yeah. And, you know, my, my wife, I, I got to say, she treated my daughter as if her, her own daughter, wow. took her in as if she was her own daughter. What a gift. Yeah. She said, oh, she's a saint, my wife. Everything <laughs> she's had to put up with me. And it's because it's tough being a step parent. You yeah, know? I can imagine. It's tough. And, um, She's had to deal with a lot, but my, I mean, my daughter loves her like her own mom. What and a gift. Yeah, and then, then shortly after we, we had our son. Okay. And it was the four of us and things were. In the Philippines at this, still at this point. In the Philippines. Okay. Yes. At this point. Yes. Okay. So you are in the Philippines, just had finally living the dream, right? You were married. Yes. Your two kids. Yes. Your career's going well. Yes. What made you move to the States? It all started when they injured my back. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, um, I've always had a bad back mm -hmm. and I've had back injuries here and there, even since I was young. Mm -hmm. But I guess the straw that broke the camel's back was when I lifted two, you know, those five gallon water containers for the water cooler. Oh, yes. Yeah. The big blue ones. Uh -huh. I bent over and picked two of them up at the same time and kind of threw them into the house. <laughs> and... They didn't teach you gotta you gotta lift with your knees, Rudy. Yeah, I knew it, but I didn't do it because I was in a rush. <laughs> and you know, you're you know, you're young and you think you're you can do anything. Yeah. And I, I wasn't thinking. It was just one moment of absent mindedness affected me the rest of my life. I mean, that probably not that alone, but also the result of previous injuries. But mm -hmm. that was the that was the one that got me. So yeah. like my foot started killing me. I was like, it's hurting so bad. I thought I had a foot wow. injury. Turns out I had two herniated uh, discs pushing against the the nerves in my spine. So I had to do, I had to have surgery. Wow. I was lying in bed for a month after the surgery. And I thought, what if I died? You know, yeah. my, I never brought my family to the United States. 
Mm. Here I am, an American citizen, you know, raising my kids to speak English, but they they didn't have the opportunity of living in the United, living in the United States. So <clears throat> my um, my wife and I decide, okay, we're going to move back to the states. So I so I petitioned them, and you know, and had your wife ever lived in the U.S. at this point? No, okay. she grew up in the Philippines, but. She was also primary, primarily an English speaker because she'd grown up in sort of a quasi-American community. Okay. Because her dad, um, her dad worked for the nuclear power plant, mm. which was built in cooperation with American engineers. So they, she grew up on a subdivision where there were a lot of Americans as well. Because they were helping build. So the, she had the language already. She, oh yeah, she had. She's she speaks English as if she, uh, you know, she. That's grown that up makes in the, the transition States. so much easier. I can imagine. Yes. So we 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 decided to move, but um, it wasn't a smooth move because our our daughter's mother was slowly getting back into her life. Okay. Because her daughter, uh, her mom had moved to Denmark. Okay. So when it was the four of us, it was really just the four of us, you know, me, my wife and our, and the two kids, mm -hmm. but her mom, so her mom was kind of out of the picture. She'd come and visit every once in a while, but, um, she was pretty much for the most part out of the picture. But when we informed her that we wanted to move to the United States, she said, no, I want her to experience life here in, in Denmark. So my wife and I, we had a tough decision. Mm. Um, are we going to fight her? for custody or we just gonna let her move to Denmark. So long story short, you know, move, there's a bunch of complications yeah, and nothing we really need to get into, but we decided it was best for our daughter to get to know her mom. Mm. She, she's her mom. She yeah. needs to get to know her. So she, she moved to Denmark. Okay. It was tough. We, we didn't want to fight with her cause you know, we said we're going to be her parents for the rest of our lives. Why make it a, relationship where we were mad at each other mm -hmm. it's just gonna make our daughter suffer in the long run yeah you know so it was tough um there were times that i regret that decision but i i hope i think that it worked out for the best so she she would visit us here in the u.s summers and you know and christmas mm -hmm. so we weren't completely you know out of her life yeah yeah, out of her sure. life, that is. Perfect. Yeah. And so did y'all come straight to Houston? We did. My sisters were both here in Houston at the time. It's a long story, but they had settled here in Houston. Okay. And they said, why don't you come here to Houston? It's a great place to, you know, to raise a family. And I said, okay. So so we, we moved. Because we Houston's very different from Hawaii. Yes. Because you were growing up in well, Hawaii. Hawaii is just so expensive. That is true. Because anything that's not produced in Hawaii has to be either flown or shipped in. Yeah. So it becomes really expensive. Okay. Yeah. That's why spam is very popular in Hawaii. Because it's cheap. Because <laughs> it's cheap because it has a long shelf life so you can ship it in. Oh. You don't have to fly it in, which is a lot more expensive. Yeah. That makes so much more sense now. So spam is cheap, available everywhere. The and thing. There's a spam festival in Hawaii every year. No way. Yeah. <laughs> What do they do at a spam festival? Oh, every type of spam you can think of. Deep fried spam, spam, you know, like. Um, See, I love food. I don't spam know if I want to try that. <laughs> deep fried spam. That mm. Breaded deep fried spam. Like I'm, any type I'm of spam good. you can think of, they have it in at that festival. Things that you wouldn't even think of. I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to pass on that one. I want to go to Hawaii, but not for that festival. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> Those fake luau's that you go to at the hotels, that's not real Hawaiian culture. Real Hawaiian culture, modern Hawaiian culture is the Spam Festival. It's the Spam Festival. Yes. You heard it here first. <laughs> if you want to get to know Hawaii, Spam Festival. How did festival. we get to Spam? <laughs> okay, no, no. We're going to take it back. Okay, okay so we so, moved to Houston. So you moved to Houston because yeah. your sisters are here. Yes. Okay, at that point, so you had talked about your faith life. It's starting to pick up yeah. when you get married. Were you where you are now? Or? No. Oh, no. Okay. I thought, oh, you know, my whole life, I think I've got it down, right? Just when I think I got it down, God shows me, no, you've got so much more to learn. <laughs> and I thought I had it down, right? Mm -hmm. When we moved, moved to Houston, of course, we 
it was weird because I'd grown up in the United States, mm -hmm. but I was having the immigrant experience. Yeah. So it's very strange. You know, we came here with the clothes on our back and our luggage and maybe just a few thousand dollars. And that was it. Mm -hmm. Like starting, starting from, from scratch. scratch, me and my wife and our son starting from scratch. So my, my sister had to take us in mm -hmm. so, uh, to, while we got on our feet. And they only had one TV. <laughs> and my <laughs> wife and I, we were so used to watching TV, so much TV. We watched way too much TV before. And they only I had one TV. I love how that's the issue. They had one, one TV. Because they never watched TV. The only reason why they had a TV was because it came with like some furniture that they, it came free with furniture oh, that wow. they bought. And that's the, only, so they never really watched TV. It was like up in one corner in the, in the house. And is so, this your sister that has five kids? The one who has five okay. kids. So what was cool was it was great be because it was like a detox mm. from being so addicted to television because yeah. we had watched so much television, you know, so we we had to get used to that. And then my sister and her husband, they were part of a Filipino uh, faith community mm -hmm. and they would have, you know, they'd have... Uh, They'd have prayer sessions and stuff at their house. They'd oh, wow. have meetings and stuff. And they, they, they had us come along. Yeah. And you're that, at the house. You're coming. <laughs> yeah. So every day it was like when you when you go to a retreat that you don't really want to be at. <laughs> every every time we were there, we're like, okay. Great. you know, yeah, Because we had never been part of our charismatic community at all. Oh, wow. We had never been. So mm -hmm. it was something completely new to us. Yeah. And it was great that we were part of it. At the time, we didn't realize and how good it was. what parish was this connected to? It's, it's a, at the time, it was called CFC FFL, which is uh, Couples for Christ Faith and Family Foundation, I think. Okay. I think. Something like that. Yeah, I, I don't, don't remember exactly no what it was. No one's going to quote you on that. Now it's, called, now it's called MFC, Missionary Families for okay. Christ. Yeah. But, uh yeah, we, they they were the first. They welcomed us in. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, we have all the, these friends, and yeah, they they were the ones that my sister and her husband they really helped us in our in our faith journey. Just from the detox from television yeah. to you know experiencing you know prayer groups and and uh, yeah. you know praise and worship that type of thing. Nice. Okay, and so I know you're involved in the choir here. Yes. At this point in your life, were you singing at church yet? Is no. that when you start? We were when we had moved out of my sister's house, we were just Sunday Catholics still. And okay. at what parish? This was at Epiphany. Okay. Well, it depended on what time we could get to <laughs> church. Okay. I, I know so that feeling. <laughs> we would we would sometimes go to to St. Teresa's in Sugarland. Okay. Because our house was kind of in the middle. St. Teresa's in Sugarland or Epiphany. But most of the time, we tried to make it to the the youth mass at Epiphany, which I believe was four thirty at the time. Was just was it five o'clock? Five o'clock? I think it was five o'clock. Five o'clock. Okay, yeah, five o'clock at Epiphany. Okay. And I remember there were many a time that we drive up to Epiphany and say, "This is too late to come in." <laughs> like it's not like five minutes before. It's like. We're five, 10 minutes late. Yeah. I guess we're going to St. Edithstein <laughs> for the 5.30. You know? Nice. <laughs> and that hey, had happened several times. Which is I respect <laughs> it. There's so many people that show up like and when you 30 have a, minutes late. When you have a young kid, it's it's tough sometimes yeah. too. Like you're, you're about to... You're about to leave the house and it's, dad, I got to poo. I'm like, what? Come <laughs> on. It's like, we're already late. Yeah. I gotta... Or they don't want to go. <laughs> That or, was that was me and or, or or they or they you know they dirty their clothes or yeah. something you got to change them or whatever yeah we joined the choir at Epiphany can't remember what year it was but that was a major step in our faith and how, what made y'all decide to join because at this point Sunday Catholics uh -huh. sometimes Epiphany sometimes not <laughs> join the choir you got to be there early yeah it's a commitment my. My wife said, you know, we need to be more active. Mm. And at the time we had, there was a new, uh, um, there was a new uh, music director at Epiphany. Okay. And he was Filipino. So I was like, you know, similar background, you you gravitate 
yeah, to them, totally. right? So we introduced ourselves and we decided to sing as part of the choir. And my wife has a beautiful voice. She does. She 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 always thought that she was okay, but she has a beautiful voice. So she became you know one of the favorites to to sing the psalm. And me, I'm just like a shiwadi wop guy in the background. <laughs> shiwadi wop, yeah, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was there struggling in the choir because uh-huh. there were, like most Catholic choirs, it's mostly women because the mm. men are kind of shy to get up on stage and sing yeah. or get not stage but get get up on. Yeah, because Epiphany, you really can see. Oh yeah, everybody. It's it's one of those circular churches, so yeah. everybody can see you. Yeah, they're looking right at you, and. <laughs> I see you. And I st- and I mentioned this during Antonio's interview, but I'll say it again. I've got a bone to pick with that guy because he always teases me about, yeah, I watched you suffer for those years at Epiphany. <laughs> and Just he wouldn't all alone, sing it. The only guy singing tenor. And I'm not that great of a singer, mm-hmm. but if somebody's beside me that's good, I can ride along with them. I, feel I can like you're match a good them. singer. I've heard you at mass. Oh, I, lo- I if I'm the only guy, I get lost. Okay. I get lost in the harmonies. Okay. And you can see it. If I'm the only guy there, you'll start s- hearing me singing the the harmony and like, ah, forget it. I'm gonna sing the melody. <laughs> and I'm done. Because I get lost. Yeah, because I get lost. I, it's easy for me to get lost. Okay. I, uh, if I sing with somebody good, I can match that. Yeah. Okay. So you start going. You're singing. Yes. So I'm assuming like Sunday mass being there early is more consistent now. Yes. Oh, yes. It was a lot more consistent. It was a lot easier than we thought it was going to be. When you think about showing up to mass early, the time commitment, oh, I don't have time for that. You know, Mm -hmm. a lot of people think, but it was a lot easier. It was a lot easier than we thought it was going to be. I mean, and we had also made friends. They became our extended family. They became, we, our family started to focus on that, you know, singing and church, you know, serving. Um, And then that choir also, whenever there was um, any type of Filipino church celebration of any sort, we'd get invited to sing. Nice. Yeah. And then that transferred over to when when they built St. Faustina. Because we talked about in my interview how you were the one who brought my family here in a way. Yes. How did you find out about St. Faustina? How did you get involved so early on? Well, we, at the time we were kind of looking to make a change. Mm. Like, so we tried out different churches and then we heard that through some Facebook groups and through some friends, hey, they're building a new church in full share because the community here has been waiting 20 plus years yeah. for, they've been begging for a, a parish because if you think about it, if you live in full share, you've got quite a distance to travel if you want to go to church. Oh, it's like 20, at yeah. least 20 minutes. So when they built St. Faustina, it was a godsend for everybody. It was such excitement yeah. for everyone. Like, oh, we're building a new parish from the ground up. You know? It's exciting. Something new is oh, always was, so exciting. It was so exciting. I still remember those days when we'd meet over at Pete and Sally's house and practice. And it was all volunteers. It was the first time that I'd experienced really singing with a bunch of guys. Wow. Aside from college, when I was part of the college uh, chorale, it was... The first time I'd sing in church with a whole bunch of guys. It was it was a dream. It, it was amazing the talent that was in the room. Wow. Like, there were a lot of, you know, great At that musicians. point, is that when Antonio stepped up? And oh, joined? Yeah, that's when I met Antonio. <laughs> that's when he decided to, you know. To not watch you suffer at Epiphany. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Antonio. Oh, that's great. I love that guy. That's the best. great. Yeah, so he, that's when I met finally met Antonio in mm-hmm. person and and a bunch of the, uh, the people who are still in the choir today and our faith started to grow even more you know yeah. father dad such i mean what can you say about father dad i remember uh, the, the literally thing I, gonna be canonized the first mass at saint faustina in the the chapel i remember him t- telling a story about you know um about a festival that rained because that's Father Dad. He's he's famous <laughs> for praying for weather and it rains, yep. right? And I remember him saying in his homily, I was mad at God. Mm. He said, I was mad at God. But then later on, of course, he found out that the, the rain was a blessing in disguise because it brought the community even closer yeah. than a successful festival would have been. Yeah. And he, he, you know, he goes to the Blessed Sacrament. He goes, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but... Him saying I'm mad at God really is like, 
he admits his faults. And I love that. Yeah. I, I said, this is, you know, I could so relate to father dad. And, you know, from then on, it's well, father think, dad home run homily after home run <laughs> homily. Oh. Well, I think the beauty of, you know, if the priest can be mad at God, if the <laughs> priest can go through that, then I feel like it gives relief as like the lady, like yes. for you coming from everything you had been through. Yes. It's like, okay, he was mad at some point. He didn't have it perfect. Yeah. And it's a priest. You can be broken and still come before God. Yeah. You know, you don't have to be super 100% holy mm. to come to church. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I mean, for the priest to admit that. Yeah. I mean, everyone sitting in the pew is broken, exactly. right? Yeah. And I, I see you're wearing a shirt that uh, yeah, says St. Faustina. And wearing, I've, got, I've got my you axe, got your bracelet axe bracelet as well. Yeah. Was St. Faustina the first time you did axe? Yes. Okay. Tell me. Tell axe me about was a that. huge thing for me. Um, <laughs> it's funny because I did not want to go on my axe retreat. <laughs> I, 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 I was. Like that's always the story. No one wants to go. I was. You know, I thought, okay, I've got it good now. You know, every time I think I have it good, God slaps me behind the head and tells me, no, you've got some more growing to do. Right? That's when God calls you Rodolfo. <laughs> so, yeah, Rodolfo, back. <laughs> you think you know what you, you know, you don't have it all together. So there I was, I was, I was between jobs at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I was teaching special ed and I kind of decided to take a break. And I was between jobs, and I remember one day after Mass, um, Jose Sosa comes up to me. He goes, have you been on the axe retreat? And, you know, Jose is a very headstrong guy. I was like, no, no, I'm, I'm good. Don't worry about it. I'm good. He's like, you're going. I'm like, no, 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 no. He's like, no, 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 you're going. He, 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 hands, <laughs> no the, choice. he hands the form over to, to Chai, to my wife, and he said, he's going. I'm like, and I give him a million excuses. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking for, I'm, he's like, no, 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 don't worry about that. You're going. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So I remember getting on the bus with Antonio. I didn't know what he was going through because he was going through a whole lot. He says it all in his interview. Yeah. He was going through a whole lot, but I'm here thinking, what have I gotten myself into? Everyone here is so holy except me. <laughs> oh, it was, it was terrible. I get down and I'm thinking, <laughs> are they going to ask me to share? <laughs> I don't want to share. <laughs> nice. But yeah, the, the I don't want to give too much about the retreat because it yeah. ruins it if you give too much out. But I say it's it was an amazing, life-changing experience mm -hmm. going on the Axe Retreat. And I, it's something that I think every guy should go through. Because you think you don't need it. You think, oh, I've been on retreats before. I've heard guys who have been on dozens of retreats mm -hmm. say, this one is different. This wow. something about this. Have you been on the, the ladies' axe not. retreat? There's one, St. Faustina, in <laughs> April. I'm going to sign you up. You're going, and I'll be, I'll, I'll be like, Jose, be Jose, you're going on retreat. No, no, there's no excuses. You're going on retreat. You're going to the axe retreat. We'll see, we'll see. Well, see, I said that too. We'll see. We'll see well, is no. So I think, no. <laughs> it's your interview, Rudy. We'll we're talking about you. You're going on Axe. I, I'm not against going on Axe. I probably will. Uh-huh. But. I know you, you've got, you've got your work is in faith. At, at, yeah, I have a lot right now. <laughs> at St. Martha's. Yeah. There's a lot. It'll happen when it's supposed to and, happen. And that's the other thing. I'm like, God gives me the things I need exactly yeah. when I need them. I'll do Axe. When I need it. And, and I needed acts at the time. Yeah. And that was amazing. That experience to be with other men who were broken, mm. other fathers who had their own self doubts, mm. you know, who were facing all the same troubles, but also wanted to be better people. Yeah. Amazing, amazing experience. That's why we keep coming back to team. Yeah. Every guy who's been on the acts team has been there multiple times. They keep That's coming crazy. back because it's a different experience being on team. The retreat itself is amazing, but being on the team is also amazing in a different way. Mm, yeah. That's amazing. Seeing everything happen yeah, behind serving, the scenes. 
Oh, yes. It's a gift. Okay, so you're between jobs. Is that when you started in the pews? No, no. I, I went back to teaching. Okay. But um, I didn't fix myself completely, I guess. Mm-hmm. I, Acts is not, you come out and you're, you're great. You're 100%. You're the ideal Catholic. No, it's just the... It's a milestone. Yeah. And so I go back in I go back into working as a special ed teacher, but I picked up a job in a severe behavior special ed unit. So it's special needs with severe behaviors. Oh wow. And that is a tough class to be in. I can imagine. Uh, you've got kids who bite, kick, scratch, and then at the same time. You're doing all this. There's a load of paperwork for teachers, mm-hmm. but for special ed teachers, it's even more. It's like five times more. It's yeah, insane. It's, and that's when I started having, I started having anxiety issues. Wow. It was tough because I was in an environment that was re- really tough to, to deal with. Mm-hmm. Well, things were so bad that I would be driving to work and I'd see a truck and I'd think, gosh, I hope that truck will hit me so I don't have to go to work. Or I would think, gosh, what if I, maybe if somebody came in to the school, I could be the hero and die stopping a school shooter. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I would think things like that because I was, it, it, the anxiety was so bad. Mm-hmm. I could hardly breathe. And there was one day that I came into work and I was having a tough day Mm -hmm. and on paper it was, you know, things were ideal in terms of the number of staff to students. So if you look at it, you're like, why is this guy having anxiety issues? There's just no explanation for anxiety issues. Yeah, there's not. You know, and I was having anxiety issues. I was, I had a hard time breathing. I would just cry out of nowhere. And so there was one day that was really, really tough and the principal and the vice principal were both out that day and they were out, I think for the next few days. So they brought in a substitute um, administrator Mm -hmm. from the district. And I went into the counselor's office and I told him what was going on. He kind of knew what was going on. And, and he, he said, okay, you know what? You should just go home, start fresh tomorrow, try to let go of everything and start fresh tomorrow. And so I start packing up my things. The kids, I think, are either at lunch or at recess at the time. And I'm packing up my things, and the substitute administrator knocks on the door, and he he comes and he pulls me aside, and he says, he goes, "Um, yeah, I know what's going on with you. Uh, He said, "Um, you probably don't remember, but I was on team for your act retreat. I'm going to be praying for you, brother. Wow. And that was kind of the first sign for me that things are going to be okay. Wow. No matter how bad it gets, things are going to be okay. I didn't realize it at the time, but that was the first sign of that. And then... in what, it, like, divine providence, right? The fact that <laughs> all these things happening and the guy that was on the team for your axe retreat yeah. happens to be at your school that week. Chris Junti, who, he, he, he said, yeah. It just, it, he happened to be there. Yeah. He said... I'll, like, I'll, out of all the days, right? Yeah, out of all the days. I, yeah. Um, needless to say, I, I had to, you know, I had to cut that short. Yeah. It was, it was tough. Um, I started seeing a therapist Mm -hmm. and so I call up, you know, I, first thing you do is you go through who's covered by your health insurance. So I, I go through the list and I say, okay, this one's close by. Let me call that one up. Right. Yeah. I pick up the phone and I'm nervous. I kind of don't want to talk to a therapist because of the stigma that comes with going through therapy oh, yeah. and through me- and mental health. So I call up and I guess, you know, the therapist is kind of busy doing something. So it seems like she's doing something. I'm like, it's okay. I'm not going to talk. And she, mm. she says, no, 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 no. Let's talk. And because I, I was about to put the phone down yeah. and she said, no, 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 let's talk. So I talk and I tell her, you know, I'm having some anxiety issues. Um, I need somebody to talk to. And so she says, okay, this is my address. I work out of my home and we, we schedule it. After talking to her the first session, I find out she's a parishioner here at St. Faustina. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> Divine providence. I'm it is. telling you. That was the second, the second sign that things are going to be okay. Mm. So unfortunately, I had to like, I had to leave um, that position. I decided not to come back. It was tough. I feel really bad about leaving. Um, because you know, it's, it, you know, you feel bad for the kids yeah. and for the staff that, that's, that gets left behind. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't blame the parents if they were mad at me, but I felt that it was what I had to do for my, for my own mental health. Well, and you can't be good for the kids if you're not good yourself. Yeah. It's like how they say in the, the airplane, put the mask on yourself first before you put it on someone else. Mm -hmm. You got to take care of yourself first. Yeah. And so that's what I did. I, 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 just, I, no matter how hard it was, I had to, to take care of myself first. Cause that's a lot of teachers. They fall into that trap where I, I got to keep doing it for the kids. Gotta, yeah. and they neglect themselves. Yeah. And I remember that year there was a teacher who had committed suicide. Oh, wow. Yeah. They had found him in his classroom one morning, I believe. Oh, yeah. That it was is so hard. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I'm thankful that the the administrators of that of the school at the time were very understanding Good. of what I'd been going through. Yeah. From there, I was lost again. Mm -hmm. You know, what am I going to, what am I going to do? Yeah. I couldn't go back to teaching. So I thought to myself, well, you know, what, what really made me happy? Mm -hmm. And what really made me happy was when I worked in radio, when I did voiceovers, when I did. So I started to, <clears throat> so I started to find work as, you know, DJ, wedding host, and all of that. I, I found a job at a radio station. Oh, nice. I got a job at a radio station, but I was it was an entry-level job. It was mm -hmm. like promotions department, but it's a foot in the door. Anybody yeah. who knows radio is, when they're looking for anybody on air, they look at who's, there, who's already there already. Yeah. And that's how a lot of the people get jobs as producers, as engineers, as they, they, get, they get in through promotions. Mm -hmm. So I was there. Like, okay, finally, I got my foot in the door. This is it. You know, I'm gonna get a job on air soon. Uh, things are gonna things are gonna be awesome. Yeah. And then COVID hits, and they lay off the entire sales and promotions staff for the entire country. Wow. Yes. So there I was thinking, oh, here I am. I'm gonna be a DJ again. Everything's gonna be awesome. And then COVID hits. Like never mind. <laughs> and that's how In the Pews kind of started. Wow. Cause Herm, who I grew up with in Hawaii. Okay. Junior. He had moved here to Houston. His company, he he worked with Comcast Sportsnet in um, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. He made a lot he made a move. They had opened up a position here in Houston. So he came here to Houston. After, you know, a lot of encouraging for me, I, I gave him the same, you know, it's a great place to start a family because he was, he had, he had gotten married a, a year or so earlier and he, he was looking to make a move and he came here to Houston. And So you were already Houston at the time when he moved. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. We were here for, uh, for a couple of years at that point. And then he ends up joining the choir too, but not as consistently as me because of his television schedule. He mm -hmm. worked with the, for television, the, he his company broadcasts the Astros and the Rockets games, Dynamo games, things like that. Nice. Yeah, some of the some of the high school sports too. Anyway, he uh, he's been trying to he'd been trying to bug me to do something, some kind of project for years. You know, let's start a podcast. Let's let's start a YouTube channel. And <laughs> you know, don't you miss doing anything creative? You've been you know because I went back into advertising. I went back and forth between advertising and teaching, and. He was like, yeah, you gotta, don't you want to do something creative? You know, he, he'd always ask me that. And I said, yeah, you know, you know maybe because you don't miss it. I'm like, yeah, you kind of do. Well, when COVID hit, we were Perfect all stuck time. at home, right? And he, we were po tossing ideas back and forth and nothing stuck. Mm -hmm. But what happened was there was a talk at the Axe Retreat that I had just teamed Mm -hmm. before covid so the a few months earlier um there was a guy who shared something that his family had been going through mm -hmm. now being in the choir i saw his family every week every sunday i'd see his family in the pews and i had no idea what they were going through 
I had no idea what he and his family were going through. And I said, stories like this need to be shared. This, you know, the story of, of faith and, you know, perseverance and, you know, turning things over to God. So, and also at the time, Father Joseph White was a deacon yeah. here at St. Faustina, but he was only assigned here for four months yeah. because he was scheduled to go to the Vatican. He wasn't to, even supposed to be here. He was, yeah. <laughs> they, they, they were just like, let's just put you over there for now. But no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so they put he, him here. He definitely at, asked because we're the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So he was here, but we were all on lockdown. Mm-hmm. We're, it was only, you know, online mass. Yeah. And speaking of online mass, my family, because my wife and son, they sing so well. And our family, since it was three people, it was only one family that's going to possibly be exposed. So we were asked to come and serve here for the online mass while nobody was here. And I got to say, it was a chilling experience. Yeah. I worked the soundboard. My wife and son sang um, as part of the choir. Mm-hmm. And... They were two thirds of the choir. And just to see mass going on with the pews empty, Mm -hmm. it's so sad. It's horrible. Yeah. Just to see, you know, the the consecration and empty. And the guilt that you feel when you're like, what? Receiving communion? Why am I one of the few? My parish family all want to receive, you know, communion but we can't we can't what have i done to deserve to receive communion while everyone else is not able to yeah so when the church started to slowly open up we decided to kind of step back from the choir and let other people serve and have the opportunity Mm -hmm. so we were so detached from our parish family yeah and nobody got to know father joseph or deacon joseph at the time so Herm and I were, you know, we'd have Zoom meetings and we'd talk. And finally, let's do a show where we interview people about their stories. Joe Rogan style, Howard Stern style, long form Mm -hmm. interview. Where we would ask them about their life story. Mm -hmm. Sit down. No matter how long it takes. Hour, two hours. Let's talk about, let's ask people about their story. So... It was funny because the way we did our interviews during the height of the pandemic was I was all the way at the end of this room and our guest was all the way at the other end of the room and they didn't come in until we were completely set up. So they would be all the way at the other end. Everything would be prepared for them. They'd come in, put their headphones. We'd start the interview. They put their headphones and leave. Wow. Opposite ends of the room. So different. Herm was on the other side of this glass with headphones on. He'd only come in to make adjustments to the cameras. Wow. That's very different. Very different. And then slowly the the tables got close together. But yeah, so that's how it that's how it all started. This experience has been like none other. Mm. At first, I, you know, when I left, when I got when I got laid off at the radio station Mm -hmm. i thought okay well i guess i'm not going to be a famous dj you know (laughs) but later on i realized that god wanted to use my talents for something else something greater not for my glory Mm. but for his glory and yeah that's another time rodolfo you think you're (laughs) going to be a famous dj no it's not all about you And what a gift that you and Herm both get to use your gifts so well. Oh yeah, I'm so now I'm so blessed to be working with Herm. I mean, he 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 makes us look good. (laughs) He's the guy behind the scenes. Yeah, all of it. I mean, just the whole experience of being able to sit down Mm -hmm. and and talk to people, hear their stories. It has moved us so much to hear. How the the journeys that all these yeah. people have been through, every single one of them, has helped us grow. It's amazing. So talking about journeys and different people. Yes. Do you want to talk about different experiences, the behind the in the pews? Oh, sure. All right. Sure. So you started with 
Father Joseph. And Deacon I, Joseph at the yeah, time. Yeah, and I believe, yeah, the first time you interviewed, he was Deacon. Oh, that was that was a great interview. I mean, he and I clicked right away. Mm-hmm. He's got that personality. That one, yeah, he and I, it's a great story. He really opened up. That was the that was the thing I love about that one. Okay, and I know you've interviewed all the clerics from Saint Faustina. Yes, and then you priest classes. Are we going to go one by one through each of them? Let's do it. Okay. Next one was Deacon Ray. Deacon Ray. <laughs> oh, if anyone wants to know about what a deacon does and how to become a deacon, Deacon Ray laid it all down there. Yeah, they did all anything about being a deacon. He's got. He laid it all out. That that was the great. And he's thing also about just that hilarious. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's just great. Okay. Who's next? And then you brought Father David Michael. Father David Michael. Yes. Oh, Father David Michael, because that was that started our Herm. Father David Michael and I. We always talk about gear. <laughs> you know, audio gear, video gear. Because he's really into this too. Oh yeah, I. He has a YouTube channel. Oh, yeah. So that started a relationship between the three of us where we, like, even during the pandemic, we'd have regular um, regular Zoom meetings where we just talk about gear. When he had something to ask about, hey, I'm having problems with this. Oh, we'd talk, awesome. like, uh, problems to get rid of, you know, noise in the audio. What can I do? Or lighting, he'll, cameras, all of that. He'll talk. He would talk to us about that. I love that interview. My favorite part was when he was talking about when he broke up with his girlfriend uh-huh. to to enter the seminary. And as a joke, I said, did she say, did she say, can't you just become a deacon? Uh-huh. And that one, he goes, great job, Rudy. That's exactly what she said. You could see the embarrassment kind of in his face. <laughs> I was, <laughs> He's like, oh, I didn't want to go there. Yeah. <laughs> I know. that was That's one thing I remember about that interview. Okay. And you've mentioned a story in passing. What's that? About him. What does he do when he walks into the room? his second interview. Yes, his second interview, we had upgraded some of our equipment. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, we had, you know, um, we had some older equipment. We we just kind of scraped together what we could during the first uh, first few interviews. But when he came back again, he looks at these mics and he goes, ooh, new headphones? New mic? (laughs) (laughs) Why am I surprised? That's Father. That is so Father David Michael. Yeah, yeah. His second interview. Oh yeah. Nice. Okay. Then you got at the time Deacon Houston. Deacon Houston. Oh, that's kind of embarrassing. My hair was sticking up here <laughs> the entire time during the interview, and I made the mistake of wearing red when I knew my background was going to be red. So it, yeah. And then Herm was also experimenting with the lighting, Father. Deacon Houston at the time came really, he came early Mm -hmm. and it rattled us. So we weren't completely set up. And yeah, so you'll see like. He's an on time. Through the course. Well, he was early, not just on time. He was early. So we kind of got rattled. We can't keep him waiting. Deacon (laughs) Houston's here. So what happened was, and we didn't have the checklist that we go through before, before the interview. Now we have a checklist, Mm -hmm. you know. Very official now. Systems go, ready to go, ready to go, check, go. You know how they do that in NASA, right? Yeah. But um, anyway, yeah, we didn't have that at the time. So through the course of the interview, you'll see slowly the lighting gets fixed. (laughs) Unfortunately, my hair doesn't go down. It's just sticking up in the back the entire time. Hey, that works out. (laughs) The thing I love about that interview was when he imitates his parents. Because as a a Mm Filipino-American— I can't count the number of times I've imitated my parents, you know, the accent. Uh And he imitates how his parents were mad when he told them when he told them that he was entering seminary. Yeah. So I I so relate to to him imitating his parents. Yeah. No, I mean, and I think we because myself also an immigrant, like we see it. Yeah. I I, and I love the the Nigerian accent. Mm. I can't say how many times like after watching Black Panther I'd walk around and say, as you can see, I am not dead. I, oh, I love that. I, lo- I also work with a, worked with a teacher who was from Cameroon. Mm-hmm. So I, I love that accent. It's a great accent. It's yeah. beautiful. Okay. And then you interviewed the one, the only, Katie Villarreal. Oh, Katie. Oh, shirt. her energy. The energy that she has. She's great. I thought I talked a lot and I thought I talked quickly. No. I thought I had a lot of energy. No, no. She... So that interview, I just had to sit back and just let her do her thing. We're very blessed to have her as a youth minister. Oh, yes. Okay. And then 
Sister Symphony. Sister Symphony. Oh, she was so shy. She's like, she's like I, I, I hate to say it, but she's so adorable. You know what I'm yeah. talking about? Feature cheeks. See? <laughs> <laughs> and she was I so. I love that one day she'll see this. She's be like, uh, yeah. Go get interviewed and they want to play too much. She cheeks. was so nervous before it started. I uh-huh. said, no, you're going to be fine. She was so shy. But yeah, I, I love Sister Symphony. No, she's so good. Okay. And then you. Interviewed Monsignor Borsky. Monsignor Borsky was an amazing interview. Mm-hmm. I mean, the life that he has lived. Yeah. When people ask me about great interviews, him being in the seminary during Vatican II, yeah. and as a young priest, while they were implementing everything, his perspective on that is amazing. So much different than anyone else. He talked about what things were like during... Martin Luther King, civil rights movement, John F. Kennedy's assassination, all of that. He lived through all of that. Amazing interview. Yeah. It, it really does give you a different perspective. Oh, yeah. Okay. Then you interviewed Carlos. Carlos. My man, Carlos. Oh, that, that's another guy with a lot of energy. Yeah. Oh, I, uh, that guy's awesome. He's great. Carlos. And then you interviewed our pastor, Father, Father dad. dad, yes. That one was a tough one to schedule because you know how pastors are just so busy. Yeah. So busy. So we had to lock down one day <laughs> that he could, we could get him to tell his story. Yeah. But the thing is long. It's a long story. It was such a long interview that we had to break it up into two parts. Mm-hmm. The first part was just his Im- immigrant experience. Oh, no, excuse me. The first part was his refugee experience. And yeah. that is just an amazing story. And we had to break for lunch yeah. after his, because it was such a long interview. But it was great because it was really detailed. And, you know, Father Dad, the way he talks is he tells every story as if it's a mini homily. Yeah. So there's a little reflection that, that he talks about after each story. So he talks about his whole immigrant experience, uh, excuse me, I keep saying immigrant experience, but his, uh, his whole refugee experience from his father being tortured since he worked with the Americans yeah. to them being put on a boat at the age of eight years old without the parents. Oh, amazing. Yeah. And then the second half was part two was his immigrant experience and joining seminary. Yeah. It's and then summer. it was so, it was such a long in-depth interview. If you want to get to know father dad, that's the interview to watch. It was such a long and in-depth interview. We couldn't even finish. It was almost time for holy hour. So we had to cut the interview short and we had to say, Father Dad, we got to get you back again yeah. for a part three. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was an amazing interview. And you did get part three, didn't you? We eventually did, yeah. but it was um, a few months later, I believe, yeah. to get him to talk about mainly about priesthood and St. Faustina. Starting the parish. That was part three. Yeah. And then you had Antonio Castillo. Antonio, my brother. Antonio. That, oh. Also and, wore his act shirt. Yes. He inspired me to wear this one, to wear my act shirt, because he wore his act shirt. Yeah, amazing interview, what he has been through. Mm. And his, I didn't know, like I said, I didn't know what he was going through when we were on that bus together yeah. to go on the acts retreat. And then even what he went through during the pandemic. Yeah. The guy's almost died how many times? Too many. <laughs> Too I, many. He needs um, to stop. Um, he, that man is a walking miracle. Yeah. Walking miracle. It really is. But then, I know I'm fast forwarding, but when we talk about his son, Tony, that story, the parallel Mm -hmm. between father and son, Mm -hmm. God bless his wife, Nancy. Yeah. No, it's been a gift, obviously, like. Everything she's been through, her her father, uh, her husband husband. husband and and his, and her son, all both going through crazy things at the same time. But look at where they're at now. Oh, gosh. Like, I love talking, because I. I saw it. I was friends with Tony. Yeah. And so being with him through the change, through everything, and then hearing him talk about it in his interview oh. was a gift. Like, oh, and, right? It's it's what you talk about, like the gift of getting to hear it. Because it is. It's like one of those stories that I'm like, you need to share this. Yeah. Um, and it's it's just been. Oh, it's, I, I had no idea. What, speaking of Antonio and Tony. Mm-hmm. So Antonio, I'd been close with him for, a, you know, for a long time while at here at St. Faustina. Now Herm, because of his work schedule, he can't serve as much as he 
he used to. Mm -hmm. Well, when we got Antonio in for the interview, Herm said there's something different about him than before. Wow. He had seen that he could see the change that Antonio had gone through before and after the acts retreat. Wow. Me, I, I didn't really notice it because I was walking with him yeah. and I was changing with him. Yeah. So it was too gradual for me to notice. But Herm said, wow, there's something different about Antonio. And Tony, I'd noticed during Father David Michael's concert, I said, there's something different about Tony. Yeah. I didn't know what it was. I said, there's something different. So when we got him in for an interview, it was Joel who had recommended Tony. He said, Tony's been on a, I was like, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we'll schedule yeah. Tony. I had no idea what he'd been going through. Mm -hmm. So when he, when we got him on for the interview, there's something different about him. And he was, I mean, and props to being so raw and honest. Oh, like he laid it all out. Oh gosh. He laid it all out. Uh, and one more thing about Tony <laughs> and Herman. And I. So we, we, we get Tony in to be interviewed. It, it's a, it was in a different cry room, but we get him into that cry room mm -hmm. and we start setting up. Herm starts fixing the cameras and everything. And her, and Tony said, oh, I forgot my water in the car. Let me go and get my water from the car. So he goes to the water in the car. Both, both Herm and I were like, this dude is handsome. <laughs> this is a handsome guy. You know? <laughs> wow. I can't wait for him to hear this. <laughs> I think it's good to acknowledge God's creations. <laughs> I mean, I mean, both of his parents are great looking people. Yeah. So, yeah. And his sister's beautiful. Oh, yeah. It's just a beautiful yeah. family and what they've been through. And <laughs> they use it all to glorify God. So, yeah. 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 Okay. And then you brought Dodie in? Dodie. Oh, that was a tough interview because she, you know, you know, all that she's been through with the suicide of her son, uh, that was, that was a hard one. We knew her story mm -hmm. and that, that was a, that was a tough interview because I didn't know how to. I'm not even sure if I, if I had addressed it the right way during the interview, wow. but yeah, that was an amazing story. I, I still remember one day during, during mass, you know, where they say, um, where they say the intentions of the, the mass and all of a sudden Dodie starts crying. I was like, what happened? She said, it's my son. Wow. His name is my son. Oh, gosh, my heart goes out to Dodie, everything she's been through. That's so hard. And then you interviewed Pitcher and Marie. Pitcher and Marie. Oh, the, the great thing about that interview, aside from all the stuff that they've been through, that was you usually see Pitcher as an acolyte and Marie in the choir, mm -hmm. right? But to get to see them together and the yeah. dynamic of the two of them together and some of their, you know, the nonverbal things when they look at each other. They're so cute. As a couple. Oh, I love them. They're and so every, everything that they've been through. Wow. I love their story. Like, I know. And even just getting through know them, I got to know Pitcher right when the parish opened up again after COVID. Yeah. We were coming all the time, right? And he was here. I think he was kind of the main acolyte for daily mass every day. Mm -hmm. um, and just getting, and the way he talks about his wife and his kids is the most beautiful thing. Oh. And it's just like, that's, that's a Catholic husband. Like, oh. That's what it's meant to be. And, with uh, Pitcher and Marie too, it's just, there was one healing mass that we had done. And I remember this was years ago. And during the mass, I could hear her wailing. Had no idea what she was going through. It was only years later when we interviewed her, did we realize what she had been going through, the weight that she had been carrying. Uh, I mean, it gives me chills just thinking about it. Wow, what a gift. Okay, and then you interviewed Father Ricardo. Father Ricardo. Oh, I love Father Ricardo. Such a great guy. Yeah. I mean, his story, amazing. And speaking of Father Ricardo and St. Bart's, mm -hmm. they have been so helpful when it comes to In the Pews. Because here at St. Faustine, it's a new parish. We don't have all of the you know facilities. Mm -hmm. They are so open to letting us use their facilities. What a gift. Oh, I walked in there so envious. Look at all this buildings that they have like we wish we had this stuff at St. Faustina I know I, I just get really envious when I walk into a church <laughs> that's already built that already yeah. has all the facilities think about it this just gives us so much to like build like I tell Father that like that's so cool I cannot think of any church I mean St. Martha's was built 
fairly recent. Like we were, but I obviously didn't know any of that. Uh huh. But we're gonna see it built from scratch. I know. It's 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 amazing. From a high from a like high school, an elementary school gym. Like we. Yeah. I'm excited. The day we have a church, like that's gonna be. Yeah, it's, it's going to be amazing. The journey's the like cool part. I remember that very first Ash Wednesday mass in that tiny community center. The parking was crazy. We had no idea which way the communion line was going to go. It was a mess. And we were all, you know, shoulder to shoulder like sardines. And Father Dad says, remember these times. Because when we have our own home, you'll look back at this and, you know, fondly. And I we remember. do. Yeah, we do. And then you interviewed at the time the pastor, Father Christopher. Father Christopher, yes, yeah. Like I said, St. Bart, they've been so accommodating to us. I mean, I, I regret that we have not been able to, We he's not there anymore, but he wanted to to kind of pick our brains when it comes to his, uh, his podcast, um, Conversing Clergy. Mm -hmm. But we just never got the schedule together since, you know, our busy schedule, his busy yeah. schedule. Yeah, Father Christopher. Yeah. Awesome. And then Matthew, you interviewed Matthew. Matthew, Matt, right? uh, Matt Ty. Matt yes. Oh yeah. That's a, that was, we wanted to find somebody who had been through seminary mm -hmm. and who had left seminary, but it was a good discern, you know, discern out. Yeah. You know? And so we'd ask father Ricardo, is there a guy that, you know, that left mm -hmm. seminary, but it was good. It made him a better man, a better father, even though he didn't eventually become a priest. And that was Matt Ty. That's amazing. Yeah. And I mean, I love the witness and it's what I always tell as a youth minister of my students that are considering the priesthood or religious life. I'm like, go to seminary. You don't waste your time. Uh -huh. Like the worst outcome is growing closer to God. Like I don't <laughs> think that's yeah. bad. And he had discerned out twice. Yeah. And, but it, like, <laughs> it's, and I love it because he said it like, it's made him who he is yeah. today. Yeah. I love that. And then you got to bring Father Houston back as a priest. Father Houston, yes. Oh, yes. That was a great one. That was the first one where we got somebody after they were just freshly ordained. Just to see how his parents had gone from not wanting him to enter seminary to being part of the parish pastoral council. Amazing. And how the support of the Nigerian community here in Houston, like during oh, his ordination, was... the roar every oh, time he hugged a, a Nigerian priest. Oh, that was amazing. Oh, and then his first mass. Mm -hmm. I was there and it was just like the whole Nigerian community. Oh, I stuck out like a sore thumb. Oh, it was gosh. beautiful. Oh, and one thing about that interview was we kind of had to rush that one because he had the emergency phone on him. Oh. Yeah, and it was ringing and we we're like, okay, okay, let's... Uh, you gotta... It seems like it's always a rush with Father Houston, we, <laughs> but but it but both interviews fantastic. That's amazing, Father Houston. And so you brought Father Houston, and you got to bring his whole class. So you brought Father Joseph White, Father Chad Henry, and Father Wayne. Yeah. So Father Joseph, after coming back from the Vatican, yeah. Oh, I love Father Joseph. Yeah. Oh yeah. And then who was after Father Houston? Uh, Father Joseph. And then you had Father Chad. Father Chad, what a character! <laughs> He's hilarious. That, the thing is, during that interview, he was a little more formal. Mm. I didn't realize how goofy he could be until afterwards. Oh, he's so goofy. <laughs> but, but it was a great interview, but I'd wish I'd known that how goofy he could be. <laughs> Take it yeah. out of him. And then you the, have, after Father Chad was. Then you had Father Wayne. Father Wayne. Now he's very different. His personality was, it, it's a lot more formal than everyone else mm -hmm. that we had been on, uh, that we'd had on the show. So that was a different, that was a different dynamic altogether with Father Wayne. But that's awesome to have so many different personalities. Yes, yeah. It, he really added a different, you know, a different different flavor to the interview. Yeah. Okay. And then in between all of those, you had part three with Father Dad. Father Father Dad, yeah, part three. We finally got him. You could see how many interviews it'd been. <laughs> that interview had been postponed several times. Yeah. With Father Dad, yeah. And then you brought Father Charles. Married priest. Yes. Yes, Father Chuck Huff, yes. So he was a former Episcopalian mm -hmm. priest who converted to Catholicism and decided to go through seminary to become a Catholic priest. Yeah. So he and his son were the first father-son Catholic priest to be ordained together in like over a thousand years. That's incredible. It's an incredible story. It's insane. <laughs> uh, yeah, Father, Father Chuck, yeah, we love him. And then you brought 
our pastoral year seminarian, Luis Armas. Luis, yes. Ah, Luis. He was, at the time, he was, you know, with the big beard and everything. Big beard. Uh, the big teddy bear, yeah. Yeah. Or a uh, big panda bear, yeah. <laughs> Luis. Ah, I love Luis. He's, He's yeah, awesome. Yeah. And then you had Daniela and Caroline. Yes. Oh, that one, we, we it was tough to schedule both of them together. Mm -hmm. And the thing about that interview was we didn't have like a great backdrop that were because it was just so tough. We had to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So it's like, let's just do it in a classroom because we got to get you all together. And wow. it, that was such a fun interview. They're fun. You're actually wearing, I think you're wearing the shirt that I was wearing during that interview. It's a lot tighter on me than it is on you. I'll tell you that. I was like, I was so thankful. I was like, thank God I have this desk because I'm like a sausage down here. It was, oh uh, yeah. But that that was a really fun interview. I can't wait to get them again. Maybe they'll do it individually this time. They're amazing. And we'll their see. story is great. Yeah, I, I want to get them on the show again. Definitely such a, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, that interview kind of shows you like, you can, I mean, a, a lot of the other interviews as well, but you can be a fun person and still discern religious life. Yep. I, I, I love that, that interview. And then you had Claudia and Sean. Oh, yes. Yes, my, my ex-brother and sister. They were with us at Epiphany, and they were also a couple that moved to St. Faustina. And their story is amazing because they had walked into an abortion clinic to abort their eldest daughter. Wow. And something told them not to. What a gift. It, that is an amazing story. Huge testimony. Amazing, amazing story. And then you had Father David Michael back for part two. Part two. That was the beatboxing one. Yes, that was the beatboxing interview. Of, uh, Father David Michael. Uh, that, yeah, we, we love Father David Michael. Uh, of course, before and after the interview, we're talking gear. <laughs> <laughs> love it. And then you had, at the time, Deacon Christopher. Yes. Oh, wow. I mean, that was another one of those interviews where we just clicked. Yeah. Like, you could see his personality really well during that interview. And that was the interview where we found out that Father Chad was such a character. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because he told <laughs> a whole bunch of Father friends. Chad story. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. what? He didn't tell all these stories? <laughs> no, Father Chad is a character. He's hilarious. Oh, yeah. And then you brought... Gabe Castillo. Gabe. Oh, yeah. Wow. That guy. I mean, you, it's, you can't describe what Gabe's like. You just can't. Yeah. You have to meet him to see what he's like. Yeah. Amazing, amazing And I guy. feel like he's so different in person than he is online, but then he's also the same person. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know how it can be so different. Like, when I first, like, when I met Gabe, I was like, he is so different than he is online. And then uh -huh. at the same time, I'm like, he's the exact same person. When when we got Gabe in, we're like, we've got to get more youth ministers in. Youth ministers are amazing. He's it's not just Katie who's like that. I was like, we got to get more youth ministers after we got Gabe on. Yeah. Yeah. No, fantastic. he's he's so good. And he, he's been, you know, I'm so thankful that he's been so supportive of In the Pews because he has a huge following. And every now and again, he'll he'll plug In the Pews and then we'll see a spike in, you know, subscribers. Yeah. yeah. No, he's So thankful great. for Gabe. Yeah, and just his mission and everything. Oh, yeah. Okay, and then you brought Sister Symphony back in. Yes, because she was taking her final vows. Mm -hmm. And that was, wow, just an amazing experience to talk to her about yeah. her, you know, what she'd done. Because she'd been all over the world since we had talked to her. Yeah, yeah she, she'd been, you know, different continents, having so many great different experiences, and just talking to her about making those final vows. Just amazing, amazing. That's amazing. And then we we talked a little bit about him already, but you had Tony in. Tony, yes. Oh, I mean, I talked to his dad, Antonio, about how he just laid it all out there for the world to see. Yeah. This is my brokenness. This is what I struggled with. And his interview is part of the reason why I have the courage to come here and tell my story. Because of his courage to tell his story yeah. and to lay it down. I love it. For everyone to see, yeah. And then you had um, Joelma from the Vocations Joelma, office. Joelma, oh, that was, that was a very interesting interview because technically we had issues with sound. There was oh, wow. We were downtown and we had a lot of noise. Mm. And 
it was a godsend that we found this like artificial intelligence plugin that could get rid of all that noise. It's amazing. If I let you listen to yeah, the samples before and after, amazing. Yeah, because as a viewer, I couldn't. Yeah, you don't notice that. Mm -hmm. But then about the interview itself, wow. Because I I had no idea what a consecrated woman is. Yeah. I, I had no idea what the focolare is. I totally 100% ignorant about that. And she, yeah, I had no idea if they existed. Yeah. You know, somebody told me focolare. I, I, I before that, I'd be like, like what? "Yes, is that part of the Illuminati?" You know, because <laughs> I, I had no idea, no, no idea whatsoever. Completely ignorant. What I get? Yeah. And then you had Keenan Anikiariko. Keenan Anikiariko. When you say Anikiariko, you have to use the hands. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was. I, I thought he was Greek because of the name, but yeah, Anikiariko is Italian. Italian. That guy. Oh, what a story! What a story! Keenan, yeah, great, talk about great a guy. reversion. He was he was recommended by Gabe, of for course. sure. Gabe Gabe has thrown a few people Not our way. Not shocked at all. That yeah, yeah, <laughs> nice, great guy. And then you got to interview at the time Deacon Jacob and Deacon Louise. Yes, so uh, Deacon Jacob. Yeah, I feel bad that I I kind of talked about that prank that. Father Chad pulled on him oh. when they were in the seminary <laughs> together. If you watch that interview, you see the reaction on his face. I think he's trying to hold it together because I think he's still kind of mad about that prank <laughs> until today. I was like, yep, yep. Yeah, he did that. <laughs> <laughs> great guy, though. And then I thought it was a great prank <laughs> from the outside. And then after uh, Father Jacob, then Deacon, who, who did we have after that? Luis. Deacon Lu Luis Garcia. Lu oh, yes. Wow. What a gentle giant. Mm -hmm. Huge guy, big, you know, you'd think he'd have this huge, gigantic personality, but such a gentle giant. And watch after his ordination, I saw the the stream of his mass in Mexico. I couldn't understand what they're saying because I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> I I learned some Spanish when I was in the Philippines because our university required it, but mm -hmm. I was still learning Filipino at the time. So I... I I got confused between Spanish and <laughs> You're Filipino. You're like, I can't learn two languages at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. One class, I have to have a C and the other class, <laughs> I can do better. But anyway, yeah. Watching that interview was just, I, excuse me, watching that ma uh, that mass. Yeah. Was so moving. So moving. Bring you to tears. Him and his, his grandparents. And oh, fantastic. Yeah. What a gift. Okay. And then you had Sister Catherine. From the Vietnamese Dominicans? Yes, Joelma recommended her. She is She's a, what a you, She could show you that you don't have to be stiff and boring to be a religious sister. Yep. You can have a big personality. You can be a quick talker. Oh, yes. Oh, oh she's oh. hilarious. I love her. That, that was a great interview. And then you had the Father Richard McNeely from the vocations office again. Yeah, Mr. Handsome. That's all I can say. I remember the first time he he's, he said mass here at St. Faustina. My wife goes, wow, that's a handsome priest. Wow. I can't believe I'm jealous of a priest right now. <laughs> Does he know that you call him Mr. Handsome? Oh, yeah. I told him during the interview. When we started out the interview, I said I had to get a haircut. I had to lose a little weight because I know I'm going to share the screen with Father Richard. That's hilarious. <laughs> and I think the, the cool thing about that interview, too, is we sat down long enough for you to really get to know him and even his mannerisms and his speech pattern, they're very unique. Yeah. Yeah. My, my favorite is, yeah, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> he said that and like, that is so, that is so Father Richard. It's amazing. And then you had Brianne. Brianne, what a story. She had, she was a really troubled youth. She had gone through all of the really tough things that the youth go through, mm -hmm. you know, everything from drugs, alcohol, self-harm, porn addiction. Like she, she is also an inspiration for me to sit down here today. Her, her interview, like, just like Tony laid it all out. This is how broken I was. And this is how God has healed me. And for her to go from that to becoming a youth minister. Amazing. Amazing. And she came I think it was before she became a youth minister at St. Barth. She came as one of the speakers at St. Faustina oh, for Zion. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And I, I remember being here for that talk, and it was amazing. And, you know, just to, when you see her walk in with all the tattoos and everything, but then, you know, 
just how holy she is. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Such a gift. Amazing. And then you had Claire. Claire, yes. Wow. Yes. Of course, another great recommendation from, you know, from Gabriel. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, God bless her, Claire. Yeah. She's so good. She's so good. And then you had Frater Giovanni. Frater Giovanni, yes. Another Gabe recommendation as well. <laughs> that was amazing to see how that was the first time we had somebody who lives that kind of a monastic yeah. lifestyle. So I said it was a very welcome change to the show because the way he spoke was you could tell he lives a very contemplative yeah. lifestyle. So he spoke very softly. He was very deliberate, very well thought out the way he speaks. And then when I talked to Father Christopher about it, he said, oh, you should have seen him before. He was a fast talker. He was a mover and shaker. Wow. But you know, the way he's changed wow. as, you know, after joining, joining the Norbertines. Yeah. yeah. And then you interview. had talking about Father Christopher. You brought him back as a priest, oh, as our yeah. parochial vicar. Yes. We, we kind of knew that he was going to be the parochial vicar here at St. Faustine. Everybody had a feeling. He was, the, he, was, he was the number one bet, you know, the odds on favorite to come here to St. Faustina. So we had to get him in to talk about his, you know, his ordination. Yeah. And about St. Faustina and about picking up the torch after Father David. Because Father David Michael's a tough act to follow. And I think Father Christopher has done it really well. Yeah. And I love it because he's him. He doesn't Yeah. He doesn't try to be anyone else. Yes. Who the way he is in the interview, that's the way he is in real life. Yep. And he yeah. is a gift to our parish. And then Father Preston. Father Preston. Oh yeah. There there was no way I could lose enough weight to be to look good. <laughs> On camera next to Father Preston. It was, it, Father Preston is an amazing story mm -hmm. because of just him giving up his dream job yeah. to enter seminary. You know, basketball, football coach, athlete, him thinking he's going to leave it all behind to become a priest and he gave it all up and then he becomes a coach mm -hmm. of a winning team as a Catholic priest. Oh, yeah. that's amazing. And then of course, like I said, you know, trying to stay, look good on camera with him. And then also, you know, talking about earlier, how God uses your gifts. Uses your gifts. Exactly. Use it. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's so funny when I, when we were interviewing Father Preston, we're like, uh, so uh, Father Preston, what's your exercise regimen? And he's, he said, Oh, you know, it's just, nah, it's nothing, right? Yeah, I'm just flipping tires, just carrying weights, <laughs> jogging. Like, really? It's nothing. Well, it's nothing, you know? And like, what do you think is a lot, Father Preston? I don't know. <laughs> here don't I know. Am. Don't want to try. <laughs> here I am, just letting myself go, and Father Preston's there. Like, yeah. It, it, and speaking of Father Preston, during one of the or, uh, ordinations, mm -hmm. So we, we, we're there and we watch Father Preston, you know, with all the line of priests. And I see Father Preston. I'm like, this is a good looking priest, right? And my wife turns over to me and she goes, that's a good looking priest. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's not just handsome, but he's also really fit too. Yeah. Oh, wow. And then you had my pastor, Father TJ. Father TJ, what a personality. He's that guy, I mean, he's a huge personality. I love he's Father amazing. TJ. Oh, I, I mean, I, there's nothing I can say. Uh, you just have to watch that interview with Father His TJ. His love for sports. Oh, yes. Oh, him, he and uh, Father, um, Father Christopher Meyer, mm -hmm. before and after the interviews, just talking sports with Herm. <laughs> like all, uh, just... And whenever we, we see each other again, like sports. I love that. No. I, and you can be a sports lover and a priest. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's good. And I, I see it when we go to our school masses and he uses the sports analogies and the yes. kids get exactly what he meant, yeah. what he means. Like, like how he said in the interview, modern day parable sports. Yeah. yeah. I love that. And then you had uh, your most recent interview, Joel. Joel. Yes. Joel. How his mom says, Joel. <laughs> Joel, that's an amazing story as well. Yeah. And you know, the this, this funny thing is, Herm and I are both Filipino-Americans. Mm -hmm. And up until that point, we had not had a Filipino on the show. So Joel is our, our groundbreaker. Groundbreaker. First one. <laughs> yes. Nice. We, we're so excited to see what his, you know, um, what his uh, career is going to be like. Yeah. Where yeah. life takes him. And then me. <laughs> Ah, yes. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, you and I, we just click 
on and it was fun. Yeah, and you were the one who bugged me the most about being interviewed. Well, you have to tell your story. I was like, <laughs> I don't know your story. I want to know your story. <laughs> yeah, so here I am laying it out, just like like Tony and uh, and Brienne and all the other guests laying out their their woundedness here for everyone to see. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned a little bit in when as we were going through that you kind of were learning a little Spanish in college, but you were still working on your Filipino. Yes. So did you not speak Filipino fluently when you moved there? No, not at all. I did oh, not wow. know how to speak the language at all. Now, some older Filipinos call it Tagalog, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of the same. Filipinos more is the formal way to say it. Okay. It's based off of the dialect Tagalog. So some sometimes it's interchangeable. Anyway, no, I did not speak the language growing up. It's tough. You know, it's easy to say, oh, you should teach your children the language. It's hard when you live in a country that doesn't speak the language. Oh, yeah. To teach your children the language. I learned that as, you know, my son, um, he doesn't speak language. Yeah. You know, uh, our daughter who had spent her younger years with us in the Philippines had learned the language because she was there in the culture. Mm -hmm. So if since my parents spoke to us in English, they we was. couldn't speak Filipino. And you mentioned your wife spoke English very well because she was in a very American community there in the yes. Philippines. But since she was in the Philippines, she yeah. knew how to speak Filipino. Yeah. So did she help you improve on your Filipino? She lectures, uh, not lectures. <laughs> she uh, she corrects my grammar all the time. Grammar, <laughs> pronunciation, no, you said it wrong. No, you're supposed to say this all the time. I love that. Yeah, because, you know, it's, I'm good when conversational mm -hmm. Filipino, but classroom Filipino, oh, that's very hard. Talking about your wife, we didn't really get into it, but how did you guys meet? We worked at the same radio station. She was a newscaster. I was a DJ mm -hmm. and we were friends and, you know, they would send us out on remote broadcasts together. We just got to know each other and we were friends for a couple of years before we even started dating. And then, yeah, we started dating and yeah, she, the rest we just is grabbed. History? Yeah. The rest is history. Love that. Oh yeah. All right. She's my better half. She's literally my better half. What a gift. Yeah. I'm sure she'll enjoy hearing that. <laughs> yes. So I think I think this is we're getting to to the end. Is there any behind the scenes, any secrets of in the pews that you want to tell us? Oh well, there are a lot of misconceptions about the show. Uh -huh. One is a lot of people think that we're employees here at St. Faustina, that the show is part of it's not. Yeah. We're just a couple of guys. Herm and I are just a couple of guys who wanted to use our talents for a ministry. Mm -hmm. So this is our ministry. I think it's because Herm makes the video look so great. You think that there's no way that this is just two dudes who wanted to start a show, a podcast or, you know, a YouTube channel together. But no, this is, this is all us. All of the equipment that we're using is just us out of pocket, you know, just put, and putting this together. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot. It's we've had to we've had to make some sacrifices to keep the show going because a, a lot of the equipment's pretty expensive, you know. Yeah. But we do it because we love it. Dude, this is our this is our ministry. This is how we, you know, we get the word out there. Like just recently, Father David Michael sent us a message. He said, "I just talked to a young man who um, is discerning priesthood, and he said that in the pews was such a huge help." to him getting to know the life of a priest and what it's like being a priest. And I just, you can't beat that. Yeah, what a gift. You just can't beat that. Yeah, and you know, when it comes to In the Pews, a lot of people think we also have a studio. We don't have a studio, no. All of this we have to break down and pack up and then take it home. And then when we do another view, interview, we set it all up all over again. We don't have a, a static studio because St. Faustina doesn't have the, and we're not under St. Faustina. And since St. Faustina doesn't have all of the space, they, they can't, you know, they can't give us a little space here. So we've had to go and we've kind of had to be like squatters. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we'll be in this room. We'll be in another room in the, in uh, St. Faustina. We've, like I said earlier, we've had such a lot of help from St. Bart. And then also, I guess an advantage too is we can drive out to different places. Like we we drove all the way out to to St. Martha's to interview uh, 
Father TJ. Yeah. And then not too long ago, our upcoming interviews, we've got, um, we drove all the way out to the Woodlands, St. Anthony of Padua, nice. to interview a couple of guys there as well. Yeah, so. There's some great guys up there. Yeah, we've tried to get, like, there are interviews that I want to get mm -hmm. that we haven't gotten yet. And we tried to get the rally nun, but apparently she's all the way out in Shiner. So we, it's tough to schedule that one to get yeah. that one to happen. You know, she's, she's the one that threw the first pitch at the Astros game yep. um, a couple of years ago. Um, Mattress Mac would be a dream oh, to get him. Amazing. I mean, that guy, amazing. He is a blessing for Houston and for Texas. Mattress Mac, I love to get Mattress Mac. Yeah. And in fact, he's Catholic. Yes. And loves his faith oh, and shares the fact that he's Catholic. Yes. So boldly. Yes. And then um, Josh Blakesley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would love to get Josh Blakesley on. We we sent him an interview uh, interview invitation, and I think we're trying to work something out. So hopefully that can happen. Okay. And then, Amazing. Uh, and then Joelma said that she might be able to get us to interview um, Bishop Italo. We'll see. Oh, because they're very close. Yeah, so we'll see. And of course, the Cardinal's a dream. We'll see, maybe. He's uh, hilarious. <laughs> I would watch that interview in a heartbeat. Uh, yeah, so. Every time he preaches, I'm like, I'm. we're so blessed to have him uh, as our Cardinal. Yeah. Of course, you know, the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going straight to the back. Uh, yeah. Pack up your bags. The interview of the Pope, yeah. yeah. You know. Maybe Father Joseph can get you in. <laughs> see, yeah, right. Yeah. 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 He's been in the Vatican, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, he's uh, met him a time or two. Well, if I could, and I know Herm has said the same thing. Since this is something that we do on the side, it's tough to get the interviews out. You know, there have been times that we've had to kind of skip a week because we couldn't get the interview out. You know, life gets in the way. Our jobs get in the way. You know, we have to feed our families. If this show was self sustaining, I would love to churn out an interview every week, yeah. like a full interview every week. That That is a dream that I have, that, this, that the show could be self-sustaining, that we could quit our jobs and just focus 100% on In the Pews and just just keep doing this. I, I would love to do this for the rest of my life. That's that would be my dream. I don't care about becoming a famous DJ anymore. There we or, go. Yeah, I don't have There's to be. The growth. Yeah, I, I would love to just sit down and and interview people and share their stories. I That's my dream, to be able to do this for the rest of my life. Okay, and you mentioned your son. Yes. Okay, in my interview, you mentioned he won, he's going to USD? Yes, now that is one of the things that has been the fruit of my wife and I serving in the choir mm -hmm. at Epiphany and here at St. Faustina. You know, he would join us for practice. Yeah. He, would, he would sit there, you know, with us in the choir when he was much younger. He'd come along and it just developed his talent as a singer. And now he's a music student in St. Thomas now. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And right before the summer, he was singing uh, with Tony. In yes. The contemporary choir. Oh, yes. And, you know, it's one of those things that, um, that we kind of just have to lift things up to God because, you know, we have made some decisions financially that we, that probably weren't good for us financially, but better for us spiritually. And God always provides, you know, he got a partial scholarship wow, to USD and there's no way we could have afforded going to USD yeah. without that scholarship. And that's just one of those ways that, you know, every, every time I think I worry about money and I worry about finances, my wife always tells me, don't worry. God has always provided for us. It may get tough and it has been tough at times. You know, like I said, we've made some sacrifices for for this show, for In the Pews, but yeah. God has always made up for it. He's always provided. Yeah, what a gift. And I think also, it's funny seeing the parallels. You went to USD. Yes, to USD. yeah. So I went to Santo Tomas and he went to St. Thomas. So <laughs> I love that. So when, when, when he enrolled in USD, I told him, I need a USD shirt. That doesn't say St. Thomas. It just says UST. So I have one of those. There you go. It's cool. Yeah. Okay. If there was any saint that you could interview. So of course they, they fast now. <sighs> one saint. Who would it be? That's too hard. I can't. Oh, a saint that I could interview. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> First one comes to mind is Mother Teresa. Mm. 
Speaking oh, of Mother amazing. Teresa, oh, I have a, a story to tell about Mother Teresa. So when when Princess Diana died, mm-hmm. you know, there was this whole outpouring of love and and grief. And I was working at an advertising agency at the time, and one of the one of the art directors was, you know, oh, loved loved um, Lady Diana, and made this whole wreath and everything with a picture. Of, of Princess Diana and the whole thing and was going to bring it over to the British embassy and she was getting people to sign it and she was walking around getting people around the office. Hey, you want to sign this? I'm going to bring this to the British embassy. And I, and she came over to me and she goes, you want to sign? I'm like, I'm okay. And then I turn over to my other office man. I'm like, I don't want to sign that. Call me when Mother Teresa dies. Sure enough, a few days later, Mother Teresa dies. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's my fault. You... <laughs> No, I'm just no, I didn't. <laughs> you didn't. It was it was time for her to go home. But she's she is one that I'd love to interview. I, I'd like to say sorry to 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 Pope John Paul II for being so dumb and <laughs> and, and for what I said when I was a, a you know a rebellious dumb teenager. Well, God willing, one day you will. I mean, there's so many saints. That yeah, there is. I, sometimes I feel unworthy. When I'm sharing the screen with the people that I interview, I think you have said it all. Have I Thank said you. too much? I don't think so. <laughs> I hope I haven't said too much. I think it's all good. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for letting me take over. Oh boy, it's tough <laughs> losing control. But then again, you know what man doesn't like talking about himself? <laughs> it was great. I love that I walked in and you were actually we. You, we really did flip tables. You're sitting on I the know, other I'm side. I know. I'm on the other side. It's so weird. It's like not having okay. your watch on. Like, it's so awkward, uncomfortable. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for doing this, Rudy. Thank I'm you sure. for doing this, too. Yeah, you're welcome. Anytime. When when we interviewed you, I said to Herm, if ever I'm going to get interviewed, I want Luisa to be the one. Wow. What yeah. an honor. Seriously, thank you. Thank you for trusting me and sharing your story. I know I've benefited from it, and I'm sure so many people will. Thank you. I mean, I've got I've got a lot of growth to do. I I know God's gonna slap me behind the head a few more times, <laughs> thinking that, that you think you got it now. No, you don't got it. You've got some more growing to do, Rodolfo. <laughs> I think we all have growth to do until the day, God willing, we make it home. Yes. <laughs>